we have started this course by giving a brief introduction uh, to the cryptography. So there we discuss classical cryptographic algorithms or historical algorithms. Uh, then in the last lecture, I discussed one of the famous cryptographic techniques, what we call hashing. So the hashing try to achieve the integrity of the uh, data. So as I mentioned, we usually using cryptography could achieve mainly integrity and confidentiality. In addition to that, cryptography can be used to achieve authentication, non-repudiation, and so many other security requirements. Uh, like when we move on, we will discuss how the different cryptographic algorithms use to achieve those requirements. So in the second lecture, which I discuss is the integrity. And we discuss hashing algorithm, message of indication codes, hash map algorithms, to achieve the data integrity purposes. The idea of the today is to discuss the confidentiality. Confidentiality, confidentiality of information can be achieved using different security controls. The simplest control is you know, username and the password. We can type the username and the password, then only legal users can access your data. So this, this is called as software control. So this pass, username password security control is very weak. So we need to get the greater control to achieve the confidentiality of our information. The best method is using encryption, or what we call it as cryptographic control. Let's say how we could use cryptographic control to protect our information. So for that, we are using a set of cryptographic algorithms. So those cryptographic algorithms basically can divide into two categories. So what we call it as symmetric key cryptographic algorithm and asymmetric key cryptographic algorithm. These are the two major categories, main categories of any cryptographic algorithm in the world, modern cryptographic algorithm, symmetric key or symmetric key. Some books say symmetric key as a private key cryptographic algorithm. Some books say symmetric, asymmetric key cryptographic algorithm. Some people call them as public key cryptographic algorithm. So when you take the symmetric key and cryptographic algorithm, we can see the classical symmetric key cryptographic algorithm which we call it as historical cryptographic algorithm and modern cryptographic algorithm. The classical cryptographic algorithm we have studied in the first lecture. So you remember we discussed transposition cycles, substitution cycles, Caesar cycle, and those cryptographic algorithms, which we Vernum cycle, especially binary Vernum cycle, very good in cryptographic algorithms, all are classical cryptographic algorithms. Uh, among those classical cryptographic algorithms, we can still use only the binary Vernon cipher. We will see when you move on how we practically use this binary Vernon cipher. So when you move on to the modern cryptographic algorithms, in the modern cryptographic algorithm, under the symmetric key, we can divide into two categories. So we call it as stream mode cryptographic algorithm and the block size. Obviously, this can also be divided stream and blocks. But usually in the modern cryptography, we divide into stream ciphers and the block ciphers. Stream ciphers, you, you remember I discussed, we encrypt the data bit by bit or a byte at a time. So Wernham is the best example. And the block cipher, we use a data block to be encrypted, not only one bit, or one byte, we use a data block, maybe eight bytes, maybe 64 bytes together to encrypt the data. Let's call it as a block size. Objective of the lecture today is to discuss about symmetric key block ciphers. Okay, so if I further divide my diagram, previous diagram, so you see there are classical cryptographic and modern cryptographic. So it's a little different than this classification you may understand. So in this classification, 
the almost same. It's divide the cryptographic algorithm or the ciphers into two qualities, classical and the body. So this is, I feel, much better than the previous one. In the classical cryptographic applications, we can see substitution ciphers and the transposition ciphers. Substitution ciphers are kind of a name for the stream ciphers, are the name for the stream ciphers. So those stream ciphers, we, could, we, we, we discussed two types, monoalphabetic stream ciphers, polyalphabetic stream ciphers, you remember. Under monoalphabetic stream ciphers, we, uh, we discussed a Caesar cipher, and few other ciphers, so in the first lecture. So we kind of discuss, and also uh, we discuss transposition cipher. So we kind of complete this part, classical cryptographic part, we already completed. Now we are under this, today our topic is symmetric key encryption. So modern cryptography so can divide into symmetric or symmetric key encryption. Symmetric call it as sacred key encryption, symmetric call as public key encryption, right? So under symmetric key encryption, as I mentioned, there are two types, block ciphers and stream ciphers. So if you name some few block ciphers, they are called AES, this, triple this. So AES, we call them original as well, we discuss them. The objective of the lecture today is to discuss modern symmetric block ciphers. What are we going to discuss is, DES, triple DES, and AIDS. So in addition to that, this course, when you move on, this course will discuss about few stream ciphers like RC4 and SEAL, and then we will have to discuss asymmetric cryptography in separate lectures. There we discuss RSA, ESA, DPL1, elliptic curve, and so on. This, 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 this route we will discuss, this branch we will discuss later on. So the, today we will discuss this branch. And the cryptographic algorithm we are going to discuss is DES, triple DES, and AES. Right. Any symmetric key cryptography algorithm, we call them as symmetric because we use same key for encryption and decryption. So for example, we have here ciphertext. We feed that ciphertext to the encryption algorithm we apply a security key, it produces a decryption algorithm. Decryption, uh, sorry, we have an encrypt, uh, uh, ciphertext, plain text here. We apply it to the encryption algorithm, we apply the security key, it produces the ciphertext. So we have plain text here, feed it to the encryption algorithm, and apply the security key, we get back the ciphertext. So we feed the ciphertext back to the decryption algorithm and apply the same security key you get the plain text. So we call them as symmetric key cryptography algorithm because we use the same cipher for encryption, same key for encryption and decryption. We use same key for encryption and decryption. So that's why we call them as symmetric key encryption algorithm. So sometimes our encryption algorithm and the decryption algorithms are exactly the same. So for example, this, our encryption algorithm and decryption algorithm are the same algorithm we use. But in case of advanced encryption standard or the AES, our encryption and decryption use two different algorithms. But we call those algorithms are as symmetric key algorithms by considering the key, right? These algorithms are symmetry on the view of the key. We use same key for encryption and the decryption. So when you think about the requirement of those symmetric key cryptography algorithm, we need to find the two functions, call it as E and D. So E represent our encryption function, E represent our decryption function. K refers the key. So when you apply e, encryption function to the security key K, so with the security key K, when you apply encryption function with the security key K to the plain text X, output is ciphertext Y. When you apply the decryption function with 
security key k to the ciphertext y, we get back the plain text x. So that's how it works. Obviously, in order to be encrypt and decrypt, sender and the recipient of this information should have access to this security key. So otherwise, they may not be able to decrypt the data. If recipient don't know the key, they cannot decrypt the data. So how do you going to distribute this key between the sender and the recipient? We discuss later on. All right. So let's try to understand the strength and the weakness of symmetric key block ciphers. So when you think about the strength first, so those block ciphers are very efficient comparing to the symmetric key cryptographic algorithm. So they can do encryption and decryption very fast and they have larger key sizes, kind of difficult to brute force and they are ideal for bulk encryption. So maybe if you have a hard disk, we can do the encryption and decryption. The entire hard disk, maybe uh, huge files, we could do encrypt and decrypt those files. So they are speed efficient algorithms. They are, these are the strengths. So think about the weakness of those algorithms. In the weakness, in the main weakness of the algorithm, we call it as the key distribution issue. So what is that key distribution issue? So for example, as I mentioned, so as the party who is going to send the data, I can create a key and encrypt that data, then I have an issue of sending that key to the recipient because I cannot use same network to distribute this key. I can use the key and create the encrypted data and send that data through the network, but I cannot send the key through the same network because somebody at the middle may take the key, right? So that is the main problem with this symmetric key cryptographic algorithm. So that problem is called as key distribution problem. So there is another problem with this cryptographic algorithm called it as scalability issue or scalability problem. That refers to the number of keys we needed. So for example, if there are two parties in the network, you know, we need to get two keys between these two nodes, right? So, sorry, if you have two parties in the network, we only need a one key. One, we need to have one key between these two people. If there are three people in the network, we, we need to get three keys between A and B one key, B and uh, let's say these parties I, B, C, we need to have two key between A, B, B, C, and A, C, right, these three keys. So if there are four parties in the network to talk, we need to have six keys, not four keys. We need to have six keys because we need to get separate key in between each other. We should get six keys. So we have an equation for that. So if there are n parties in the network, that is n nodes, we need to have n, minus, n multiply n minus one divide two number of keys. So for example, if there are four people in the network, we need four multiply three, that means n multiply n minus one, four multiply, multiply three divide two, that is six keys. If there are 10, 10 nodes in the network, we need to get 10 multiply 9 divided 2, that is 45 keys. Similarly, if n increase, that is number of nodes increase, the keys needed exponentially increase. So, so that point it has scalability issue. So we, because of this scalability issue, we usually consider the symmetric key block cipher as a key management problem. So it has the 
poorly distribution because the way we, we don't have proper way of distributing the symmetry. We don't have the proper way to achieve the scalability. And in addition to that, we cannot use those symmetric key system to achieve the security features such as non-repudiation. We will discuss what non-repudiation is later on in some other lecture. So basically, in the symmetric key systems are very efficient, but they have some weaknesses. So then we will discuss other cryptographic categories that what we call that the symmetric key systems, they are used, those algorithms are used to overcome those weaknesses. When you move on, we will discuss how those asymmetric key cryptography algorithms are used to overcome these weaknesses. Right. So let's move to the topic today. So today we are going to discuss symmetric key block ciphers. Block ciphers use more than one bit, one byte at a time to encrypt and decrypt. So they have the larger data blocks to encrypt at once. So since they use more than one byte to encrypt and decrypt, so they have a good confusion and diffusion properties. So as you remember, I discussed confusion and diffusion in the first lecture. So if it is a block cipher, we could get more diffusion, obviously, then more confusion. And those block ciphers has larger key size, so then we can get advocate level of security. And when you see the inside of those block ciphers, you can understand they are internally do this encryption and decryption in several rounds. So they have several internal rounds to protect the security. And when we use those encryption block ciphers in encryption and decryption, we, ha we have to use some encryption decryption modes. So that these encryption decryption modes of the block ciphers we discuss later on. The first generation of symmetric key block ciphers created by using what we call it as Pestel Network. Pestel Network is proposed, Pestel Network is proposed in 1973, uh, and then this is mainly used to implement several block ciphers such as DES, IDEA, RC4, and many more. So the modern, recent block cipher, which is called as A, is not based on this crystal network. Let's try to understand how this crystal network works in order to understand how this DES algorithm works. So those networks basically has n number of block size divided into two halves, what we call it as left halves and the right halves. So we apply the security to those one of these halves in number of rounds called D rounds. So pastel function we apply into first round, second round, and the D round uh, to one of the half. And then we interchange those halves. So if we see that how it works some in detail. So you can refer to this diagram to understand the face network. So our data, we first divide into two halves, two equal halves, called left half and the right half. So I will take uh, some block cipher, let's say this. So I will come to this in a minute. So it has a 64-bit block. So this 64-bit block, we divide into two halves, for example, 32 bit left half and 32 bit right half. Then what we do, we take the 32 bit left half and we take the 32 bit right half, apply some function for F1, pastel function for F1 to this right half and add that right half to the left half using this X operation. And the result 
is take as the new right half. And then our old right half, that is R0, will consider as the next left half. In other words, we apply the security operation to the next half, left half and it moves to the right and we take the right and just move to the left. And then we repeat the same. That means we take L1, that is new left half, and the R1, this is our new right half, we add our new right half to this function f, it create xo with the left half, and so on. It's, it's continue like that. So based on this space infrastructure, so advanced encryption standard or the best are created. So we start up kind of like, you know, right now, you know, the cryptography started long time ago before computer science. So the people start applying cryptography into computing somewhere in 60s. So then they realized that we need to agree in common standard. Otherwise, different people might use different algorithms and techniques. So then each of these computing devices may not be able to talk to each other because each other may not have an idea of the algorithm. Especially US government thought of standardizing this encryption, decryption process and want to introduce a public algorithm to the entire world. So they conducted kind of a competition at that time and selected the algorithm proposed by IBM as the international standard. They have published this standard saying FIPS publication 46, that is Federal Information Processing Standard. FIPS refers to Federal Information Processing Standard number 46. That describes uh, the entire DES algorithm. So this DES algorithm has 64 bits data blocks, as I mentioned, and it operates with 56 bit keys. So it was published somewhere in 1977, and since then it used heavily all over the world. So unfortunately, it has 56 bit keys. That is possible to Bruce what right now. Okay, let's see a little bit inside of this desk now. So as I mentioned in the desk, block size is 64 bit, key size is 56 bit. Actually, it, six, some book says it's the 64 bit keys used that is wrong. Key size is 56, but they have some method of adding parity bits. With those parity bits, they become 64, but the real key size of the DES algorithm is 56. Then this algorithm use 16 internal rounds. I'll explain those rounds in a minute. So in order to do encryption process, internal encryption process in each round, it uses 16 different keys. So those keys will be derived from the master key. So in the abstract level, we have a DES algorithm and we input the plain text in blocks. Each block is 64 bits, that means eight bytes. And we free input the security key. The size of the security key is 56 bits. And this algorithm will produce 64 bit longer ciphertext. So we have a plain text, feed it to the desk algorithm, apply the security key, it created the ciphertext. So this is encryption. The decryption is opposite. So for example, if you input the ciphertext here and security key, we can get back the plain text. So that's what we call it as symmetric 
ki el doyulur. So I said that this uses 56 bit keys. So actually, how the this derive the key? We use seven bytes, seven bit of our key here, and eight bit. The, it's a parity check bit. So basically, keys are created in a way. Last bit is the parity check bits. So even though have our key is 56, seven by seven bits of this 56 bit key distributed through this key space. And since we insert one bit at the end of each byte as a parity check bit, finally it becomes a key 60 bit, 64 bit longer. But the real size is only the 56. The, we added one parity bit to this. Since the real size of the key is 56 bit, we can have 2 to the power 56, that means 7.2 multiplied 10 to the power 16. Actually, it's 10 to the power 16 as a problem on this slide, 10 to the power 16 values of the keys. So this is kind of a large number of keys. So in some 90s, mm -hmm. searching for this key space is almost impossible. But you know, in the day by day, computing power exponentially increased. Therefore, boot forcing the test key at present is a simple task. So anyone can boot force the test key in a short period. Okay. Let's try to do, see little inside of the DES algorithm uh, now. So, so as I mentioned, this is a block cipher. Input block size is 64 bits. So that is 64 bit input. So, uh, so in the DES algorithm, after we feed this initial input 64 bit, it has an operation what we call initial permutation. So after do this initial permutation, this algorithm divide this data into two halves because it works in the network structure. So they call it as left half and the right half. Then we take the left right half and add this function called substitution and it based on the security key. And this output XO with the left half and move to the right. And then right half will move to the left. Then we take this again and apply this function F and mix it with new left half and put it to the right. And this one will put it to the left and so on. After we do such 16 rounds, we will do some permutation operation. It's called as inverse initial permutation. So we have initial permutation. At the end, we do the inverse of that. That's called as inverse initial permutation. So then finally, we get back our ciphertext. So we see we have the 64 bit inputs going to 16 internal rounds with 16 intermediate keys and finally create the output of the ciphertext. Right. So as I mentioned, in the desk algorithm has 56 bit keys. Since it has 56 bit keys, it could be easily brute force. So nowadays, so we need to strengthen this algorithm. So how do you strengthen this algorithm? Mechanism we use to strengthen this algorithm, we call it as a triple disk. Triple disk algorithm uh, can be used with more than one disk keys. Let's skip this slide and see this slide for the moment. 
So how do you do this triple list? So in the triple list is encrypting our data in several data sites. So for example, we have plain text here. We feed it to the desk algorithm with the security key K1. It produces some data or cybertext. So then we feed that cybertext back to this desk algorithm with, and then encrypt with the se separate key. Then it come back some output here. So this output again encrypted with the third key and it produced the final ciphertext. That means we do first round encryption with K1. We do encryption actually, since we do it the second time, we call it as decryption with the different key, because we feed the ciphertext here in the second round with the, not the same key, different key. So then decryption with the different key, it gets the different garbage here. So then that garbage will encrypt back with the third key. So, and produce the cipher text. So since we have three different keys here, so we need to, if someone want to boost force, they have to boost force the combination of all these three keys. So each key is 56 bit long. Then we have, I think, 168 bit longer key space to boot force. That means we need to Good force, 2 to the power 168-bit combination of the keys. So that is still nearly impossible. Triple Ds can be used. Uh, so in the decryption, how do how Triple Ds get decrypt? There we have the ciphertext. We feed it into the Triple Ds algorithm. So first of all, we have to decrypt with the key 3, the last key. Right? Then we need to decrypt with key K2 and then decrypt with key K1. Then we get back the pen text, opposite direction. So that's how triple disk decrypts the data. So triple disk can apply in this way as well. So in this way, what we do, we have a plain text. We encrypt that plain text with the key K1 and we get back some ciphertext. We, feel we decrypt that ciphertext with key K2, different key, then we may not get plain text here, instead we get the different encrypted data, some, some data here. So that data will encrypt back with the key K1. <coughs> that means we do K1, K2, and K1 here to produce the ciphertext. Only two keys used, K1, and K2 are the two keys used. So when you use keys in triple A's, you need to be very careful because if you use the same key in two consecutive rounds, so these two rounds get neutral. So for example, if you have plain text and apply key one here, and obviously we have ciphertext, so we feed that ciphertext to the desk algorithm and apply the same key K1 here, we get back a plain text. That means, so we encrypt here, then decrypt here. These two rounds get neutral. So on, then, real encryption is only this round. So there we apply the key called K2. So it produces then ciphertext. So as you may understood, so if you do like that, we can downgrade the triple disk into a single disk. So we do that to have the backward compatibility because some people might may not have triple disk implementation. They may have only the single disk. So then we should downgrade our triple disk to single disk. So if we want to do so, what we do, we apply some key here and we apply the same key here then it neutral, and then we apply the real key in the third round. So it produces then the ciphertext. So we do this for the backward compatibility. Okay, so far we discussed how this works.
you know computing power usually increase day by day and we need to increase or the we need to strengthen our algorithm because of that day by day otherwise attacker will do post this algorithm the first cryptographic standard for data protection is this or what we call it as data encryption standard introduced in somewhere in 70s and we are you we were using it somewhere around 2000 so around 2000 we understood that people could brute force these desk keys so we need to get a method of improving the strength of this desk algorithm method we use to improve is triple desk we have discussed that as well so, however this triple desk algorithm may not be continuously used so we need to get better algorithms the paper realized it's somewhere around 2000 so again the u.s government started producing a better algorithm so what they did they they conducted a competition back to identify best algorithm in the world they called for proposal in 1997 and they evaluated it and then shortlisted 15 candidates uh, sorry the shortlist is five candidates and then further evaluated that and finally they selected an algorithm for Regin Dahl submitted by two Belgian crypto backers as the next international standard for data protection they named this algorithm as AES so that refers to advanced encryption standard so they they Publish this standard in a publication called Federal Information Processing Publication 197, somewhere around 2001. When you think about this AES algorithm, uh, AES algorithm has a little bit different properties uh, comparing to the desk. AES algorithm is again a block cipher, the block size is double. So that means AES block size is 128 bits. This block size is, you know, 64 bit, but AES block size is 128 bit. Uh, 100, sorry, AES block size is 128 bit block. And it also has larger key sizes. Not only the block size, AES key size also larger. So you know in the desk, key size is 56 bit. AES, the key size, default key size is 128 bit. So however, this algorithm support 192 and 256 bit keys as well. So that means it has three different key sizes. They are blocks size is 128 bit so this algorithm introduced somewhere 70s and we, are, we were using this algorithm till 2000 that means this was there kind of 30 years so AES algorithm introduced to the world somewhere around 2000 and now we are in 2020 so we, we hope that we may be able to use AES kind of another 10 years. So this we use for 30 years. We expect AES to be valid or AES to be used until 2030, kind of like 30, 20 to 30 years. So since the computing power increasing day by day, we never know. So somewhere around 2025, we might need different algorithm. So far, we are okay. The present cryptographic standard for data protection is advanced encryption standard or AES. Block size is 128 bit. Recommended key size right now is 256 bit key. Initially, we were using 128 bits now the key size is 256 bits unless otherwise use 256 bit keys 
someone will be able to do those, this algorithm. So if you want to use AES in your application, remember to use it with 256-bit keys. Let us discuss a little bit of that computation I mentioned because it's, it's uh, the selection of AES, uh, uh, AES was decided selection uh, actually based on very interesting property of cryptography. So for example, when you consider number of encryption cycles in the world and the decryption cycles, so which cycles are larger? So for example, let's say we are counting number of encryption happens in the world and number of decryption happens in the world. So you might think they are equal. Actually, they are not. So usually the decryption cycles in the world are re huge compared to the encryption. Why this happens? So for example, let's take your hard disk as an example. So you might encrypt your hard disk only once. So after that, every time you boot your machine, machine has to decrypt that data. Similarly, let's say you have some data which you back up it. So at the time of you back up your data, you might encrypt it and back up. So later on, when you want to restore it, so you are restoring it from this backup. So but you might restore your backup several times, but you may encrypt it perhaps only once. So as you may see, you may do encryption, produce perhaps once, and then in order to access this data, you have to decrypt it in several times. So why I mentioned that, that is the fact the judge panel decided when they select Retin Dahl as the best algorithm in the world. Comparing to the other, other shortlisted algorithms, people realize that Retin Dahl has the fast decryption uh, statistics. So actually, Retin Dahl may not work based on this uh, pastel networking model. Instead, they have two different algorithms, one for encryption, other one for decryption. Their decryption algorithms are fast. Since we have, most of the time, since we do decryption, what we require is fast decryption algorithm. So because that was the reason the Regenda was selected as the present international standard. So as a summary, so you, uh, which I mentioned is the present international standard for data protection is advanced encryption standard or AES. It, based on the original algorithm behind it, it's regional proposed by two Belgium cryptographers. And the US government announced it as the person cryptography standard in somewhere around 2000 with their publication called it as Federal, Federal Information Processing Publication 197. If you're interested on, you can search those uh, numbers and you can see those publication online. Internal detail of these AES algorithms, I have mentioned some of them. Let me summarize that. Internal uh, strength, like block size of the AES is 128 bit. Key size, three different key sizes can be used. 128 bit, 192 bits, and 256 bit. So internally, AES works in 10 internal rounds. So each round, AES use 10 internally derived keys. So there are encryption algorithm and decryption algorithm is different. Uh, so basically there are decryption algorithm is fast comparing to the other 
algorithms in the world. So in order to understand how this AES works, so we could use this diagram. Instead of this diagram here, I will show you a short video which demonstrates this AES encryption lifecycle. Let me start this video in a minute and take you through that. Uh, give me a second, I will start that video. Right. I will share it. Uh, let me share it. Right. I think you will see my window here. Yes, sir. It's visible. It's visible, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So this short video demonstrate how this AES encryption works. So it is 128 bit uh, uh, block cipher, as I said. So how it works? So you see, it has the encryption algorithm here, encryption. So it has the plain text here on the feed 128 bits and then we have the cipher text here uh, cipher key security key we feed it and we get the cipher text so what we now going to look at it in inside of this encryption how it works internally so if you want to encrypt the data in AES our data need to be fed into four by four matrix. It's called a state array. Actually, it's a matrix, four by four matrix. All our data to be converted into hexadecimal form. So these are the hexa values of this data in the yellow color. Then in order to do this encryption, we need to have security key. Our Initial security key, let's assume we are using 128 bit keys, uh, for example. So those keys also arranged in the four by four matrix, the blue color, blue color matrix here, four by four matrix, blue color one. So that is your cipher key, security key. So the yellow color matrix as your plain text. So both are arranged into four by four matrix. 4 by 4 means 16 bytes. 16 bytes means 128 bit blocks. So our input is 128 bits. Our key is 128 bits. So our data, yellow color one, goes to what we call it as encryption process. Our blue color uh, matrix go to what we call it as key generation process. Because in AES has 10 internal rounds. Each of these internal rounds requires separate key. So what we do, we have initial cipher key. So using that cipher key, we will derive 10 internal keys. Right, so we discuss how these keys derived later on. So let's see how this encryption process works right now. Encryption process. The encryption process internally has four operations. So we call it as substitution operation, shifting operation, mix column operation, and add round key operation. These are the four operations, sub bytes, shift rows, mix columns, add round keys, right? 
So what we have is the plain text on the top, and we have the cipher key, blue color. So what, what we first do, we add this cipher key using a function called add round key to our input data, and we do then substitution, shifting, mixing, and round keys, and do it 10 times, actually nine rounds. Then we do the last round, the 10th round. As you may see, all this nine round has substitution, shifting, mixing, and end round key. The last final round has substitution, shifting and add round key only. Mixing column is not there on the last round, right? So then like that, there are 10 rounds of operation. Now let's have a look on each of these rounds. Or what we call it as each of these transformations. So substitution transformation, shifting transformation, mix column transformation, and add round key transformation. We're going to look at now. Substitution transformation. So those substitution transformations uh, handle using a lookup table, call it as X boxes. I will show you in a minute in the AES specification. Basically, AES use some kind of mathematical functions. And what we do we do pre-calculate those mathematical values and create what we call it as Xbox. It is a kind of a log table. It is a lookup table where we don't want to do calculation. Instead of we can get the answer by doing a lookup throughout this table. So we use Xbox or lookup table to do substitution. So for example, in the left side, we have a yellow four by four matrix. That is our plain text. So the first we do, we take the first byte of this plain text. And it is, you see, one nine, it's hexa format, one nine. And then we substitute this one nine with a different value. So the value we take from this X box. So for example, since it is one nine, we look for first row here and the ninth column. So then take the value, it is D4. We put that D4 here. Then similarly, we replace all the ciphertext here using this Xbox. We then get the some data here. So this data then feed it to the next transformation operation or function, we call it as shift rows. In the shift row function, what we do, we are rotating those rows starting from the second row. So for example, the second row we rotate once, third row we rotate twice, Fourth row we retrieve price like that. So it, this operation is called it as shift row operations. So after that, we move the, into the third operation that's called it as mixed columns. In the mixed column operation, what we do, we take the first column of the data and then do metric multiplication with this matrix. So, and we produce the output. So this output will be put it here in the first row, like that. So we take the all rows and then do metric multiplication and the result will be replaced in each row. So that call it has mixed columns operation. Then we have operation, final operation, Call it as add round key operation or add round key function. Add round key is the function where I apply our security key. So for that, what we do, we have our input data with four by four matrix. 
So then we have a round key. That is the key we created using the initial cipher key. So then what we do, we take the first row of our input data and then we take the first row of our cipher key and we XOR each other. And the result will be put it to the output. So similarly, each row of the input, we add the key, intermediate key, we call it as a round key, and create this output. So that is what we call add round key operation. So we do these operations, as I said, nine consecutive rounds. So like in the first round, second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh, eighth, ninth rounds. Finally, in the tenth round, we output, final output is the cipher text. So you see, so AES algorithm is organized in 10 sub rounds. Each round has four operations and input finally using those operations, our input plain text will convert it into the output cipher text. In order to, to add round key operation in each round, we need to generate internal security keys. So those internal security keys generated using the initial cipher key, and we use a method called key scheduling to do so. So let's have a look how the key scheduling works. In the key scheduling, so we have an initial security key or the cipher key it is in blue color. So then what we do using this initial key, we will create 10 intermediate keys. So how we do that, again, we use Xboxes to do that. So we take the last row of the cipher key and we rotate once and we substitute the data in this column, actually last column with Xboxes similar to the substitution process we used previously. And each of these column output will XO with the first column and then XO with this matrix and the result we put it here as the first column of the first key. Then we take this new first column and take the second column of the cipher key, XO them together and put them into the second column of the new key. Similarly, take the second column and the new key and the third column of the original cipher key, XO together and put them put it into the third column of the new key. Then take the third column of the new key and the fourth column of the original key, XO together, and then put it as the fourth column of the new key. Then we get four by four gray color matrix. That is the new intermediate key. So similarly, we generate nine other intermediate keys like that. We substitute it, we XOR it, we get the first column, and then we do XO and receive the rest of the columns of the second key, like that. And in the third round key, fourth round key, and finally the tenth round key. So those round keys applies into these each internal operations. So that's how in detail AES works. So if you want to read the mathematical background of the AES, 
plus how it works uh, and there are pseudo codes you can search for this FIPS standard I will show you if you interest I can share with our JIT account this is uh, FIPS 197 standard let me share it and show some important things in this standard. This is, I think, you see that, right? Federal Information Processing. Right, I share it. So you see, this is Federal Information Processing Standard Publication 197. It's a public document, published in 2001, uh, number 26. It has all the information of this AES algorithm. Uh, you see, it has all the definitions of each state. How do you get bit patterns? How do you create those arrays? and one are the states which I explained to you and mathematical uh, preliminaries and then mathematical functions it use uh, for these calculations and the mathematical operations and then polynomials with coefficients in GF actually the functions it use uh, GFP is used and algorithm specifications everything is there so you it's a matter of reading it carefully if you are good in maths you can read it, this specification and understand how mathematically this algorithm works so I have shown you how we really implement it so for example this is a pseudocode uh, or pseudocode in reverse operation and then on the top we have pseudo code of encryption operation uh, for of inverse cipher here this is pseudo code of key and expansion that means getting uh, taking the uh, intermediate keys like that this specification describes everything required everything in every internal detail of AES algorithm so if anybody interests they can use this to uh, uh, get uh, to study that. Right now, I will go back to my slide sharing the presentation. Let me see, we are here. So, I think you see my slides now. Can you see it? right yes sir right so i back to the slide okay sir. so we, we we discuss now uh, aes algorithm in detail so now let's see how practically use these algorithms aes or less algorithm both are block cycles that means we use one data block at a time for encryption and decryption this block size is 64, AES block size is 128 bits. So in practically when we want to use this algorithm, so we may not have our input exact block size because sometimes we might have five bytes to encrypt with this. So but this requires eight bytes. So how can we use five bytes to encrypt if they need eight bytes? So that means if you have five bytes, we need to add some three double bytes to make it eight. So making yes. our input data into a big block, different blocks equal to this whatever block size is called as padding. There are different padding schemes in the world. So the famous padding scheme which used with the block cipher call it as PKCS5 padding scheme. So PKCS refers to public key cryptographic standard. Public key PK cryptographic standard CS. 
Public key cryptography standard number five describes how this padding works. So this DKCS5 padding is simple padding scheme which you use in any block ciphers. So actually, initially this DKCS5 padding proposed for the desk. So later on, they change that padding scheme or further describe this padding scheme under DKCS standard number seven so there are two types, PKCS5 padding and 7 padding, both are almost the same. But PKCS7 padding can apply for any block cycle, in any, any, any block size. Usually PKCS5 padding says it used only for 64 bit blocks. But both use the same mechanism. So let's have a look how PKCS5 padding scheme works. Objective of the padding is to make your input data equal to the block size. How do you do that? So for example, let's say we have 64 bit block cycle, that is this. So 64 bit means we have eight bytes needed to do the encryption. So let's say we have only seven bytes. So then what we should do, we need to add one byte to make this input to be eight. So in the PKCS file it says if you do that one byte, add number one binary one. So let's say we have only six bytes, then two bytes needed to complete the padding. Then the scheme says add two times number two. So similarly, let's say we have only five bytes, so then three bytes needed for padding. Then the scheme says we should add three times number three, like that. So let's say we have only one byte to encrypt, then seven bytes need to be added. So then we added number seven, seven times. Actually, further PKCS file padding scheme says we have to always pad. That means if you have equal block size equal to this, our plain text size is equal to the block size, we have to pad it as well. So in this, that situation, we need to add the new block with 0, 8. <coughs> if, the, if our data is equal to this block size, that means no padding needed, but we still pad with entire block 0, 8. There's a reason for that. I'll explain it in a minute. So when you have a look, what I explained, usually it's something like that. So we have this data, three bytes. So we need to be eight. So that means we have at five dummy data, zero five, five times. So then we encrypt that block and we send to the other side. Other side will decrypt them. So then, we, then we see, they will get this plain text and the recipient will see, okay, there are five times five. Then they should understand, okay, this is fair. So they remove all yellow color data blocks. So for example, here we see then the next row, there are four bytes. Then we have to add four dummy bytes then. So in the recipient see four times four, they know this is padded. So they remove all the last four, rightmost four bytes. Like that you see in the last one, so we have the data equal to this block size. Even though we have the data equal to block size, we have to pad. That means we have we will add the new block with all eights. And we encrypt both blocks. So and then we transmit that data to the other side. So then the other side will decrypt the both blocks, and then they see the last block is all eights, so they remove entire block. Why do we want to do so? We want to do this so because let's say we have a situation here in the last line, last book, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, our plan text. So assume if these last two bytes are for some reason 0, 1, and if we don't add the new block here, what's happened? So the recipient might think it is, uh, there are two zero ones. They might think, okay, in the last zero one is the dummy, they re remove one. So for example, let's say this, 
Yeah, our plain text has exact data, and last three is zero three. Last three cells are zero threes. So recipient might think it is a dummy, and they might remove that. Even real data, they might remove it. So we want to stop that. How do we stop that? In case we have the data fit into the block, even though we have that, we add a new block with padding. So then the real data is safe. So that's how the PKCS file padding system works, padding scheme works. So why we need this padding? We, first of all, if you practically use this block ciphers for encryption of the data, first practical problem we face is to make our input data equal to the block size. So how do you do that? We do padding. Which standard we use for that is PKCS5 padding. Right. After do this padding, we need how do you do the encryption? So those encryption, we do it in several methods. So methods we use to do this encryption, call it as encryption, block cipher encryption modes. The simplest block cipher encryption mode, call it as electronic code book mode or ECB mode. So how this ECB mode works, is actually we divide our message into eight byte blocks, for example, in this, and we apply each block separately with the key to this block cycle algorithm. Maybe you can understand how it works in this diagram. This is our plain text. So we divide this plain text into the eight bytes because we are using this. So if you use AES algorithm here, so block size should be 16 bytes. So it is eight bytes because we use this. So we divide our data into eight byte blocks. We take the first eight byte of our plain text, encrypt it with the DES applying the security key. It produces the first eight byte of the cipher text. Then we take the next eight byte of the plain text apply it to the DES algorithm with the same security key, it produces the next eight byte of the cipher text. The next eight byte taken, the encryption with the same key produces the next eight byte of the cipher text. Then we reach to the last block. Last block, we may not have the eight bytes. So then, then we do padding and then make it eight and feed it to the algorithm with the security key, create the last block. So each and every eight bytes a block, we encrypt separately and produce the cipher text. So then how do you decrypt that? We take the first block, feed it to the algorithm with the same key, we get back the plain text. And the next block, decrypt, get the plain text. And in the last block, decrypt, get the plain text, and we must remove the paddy. So we get then, the plain text after removing the padding. So we recover the data. So this is the simplest way of doing the encryption. Uh, uh, use the encryption, uh, a block cipher. Simplest way of using a block cipher to encrypt the plain text, or what we call it as clear text. So this particular mode is called it as electronic code book mode, or ECB mode. So, in, however, we are not recommending this ECB mode in case we have a bulk encryption, plus in, in order to do communication. So like if you want to encrypt videos, pictures, we are not recommending to use ECB mode. So there is a reason for that. Let's assume, so a bitmap file, bit image file. So in the bitmap file, you know, in the image, so each, each pixel represented by one byte. So this one byte, it's a color of this particular picture. So we have then in this bitmap file or the bit image file, maybe we have eight byte. Each byte represents 
or a pixel color. So then what's happened? We do encrypt this pixel value and we get back the ciphertext. Ciphertext is a, any, any, another number. It's a binary data. It may be another number. That means it may be another color. So in other words, what that means is actually when you do encryption, I see some image with ECB, we can still visible part of this picture. So that might be possible. It's not always, but it might be possible after the encryption features of the image can be visible like that. Why so? Because we individually take eight bytes and encrypt them individually into the ciphertext. Similarly, if I go back here, other problem is if something goes wrong here, for example, if attack, uh, when, this, then when we transmit this block to the other side, if attacker flip some bits there, that may affect only to this block. So some people might think that is an advantage because then error may not propagate. So if something goes with that, that effect to that block only, then means other blocks will receive without problem. So obviously that is kind of plus point. But the minus point is they are because, for example, let's say this our clear text is a transaction, and then this eight byte is our account number. So then, if someone we encrypt that account number and we get the ciphertext of account number, and some attacker flips some bits here, then what might happen? This account number may decrypt to some different number. So then our transaction might go to different account. So that is called as insertion attacks. So ECB is vulnerable for such insertion attacks as well. So because of that weaknesses, we are not usually recommend to use ECB cipher, uh, ECB mode, electronic code book mode in encrypting content or encrypting the data which sends via the networks. Instead, what we recommend to use is cipher blockchaining mode, or we call it as a CBC mode. In the cipher blockchaining mode, in addition to this initial, in addition to the security key, we are using another key, what we call it as an initial vector. Maybe you can read this slide, but I use the diagram to explain that. Mm -hmm cycle blockchain mode or the CBC mode, in the CBC mode, what happened, we divide this plain text into eight byte blocks. And obviously, in the previous case, last block we will pack. And we take another random number that we call it as an initial value or initial vector. In addition to this security key in this ECP, the CBC mode, or we call it as cycle blockchain mode. So there, what happened, we take the plain text and we do X operation with this additional initial vector. So the size of the initial vector is usually the size of the block. So if it is eight byte, that means 64 bits. So initial vector is 64 bits. In case of AES algorithm, this is 16 bytes. So initial vector should be 16 bytes. So what we do, we take the first block of the plain text, XO with the initial vector. So XO means a binary word on cycle with the initial vector. So then the output of that, we feed it into the data encryption standard or AES, advanced encryption standard or block cipher in general. So we do initial XO with the initial vector and then the output feed it to the block cipher with the security key. So it produced the first block of the cipher text. So then we have to do the same for all other blocks. So there what we do, we take the next block of this uh, plain text, 
And we need to get the initial vector now to do the XO. For that, what we do, we take the output of the previous block as the initial vector to this next block. And we do XO together. And that will feed it to the algorithm, create the ciphertext. So when we, then we move on to the third block. In the third block, we take that and take the second output ciphertext as an initial vector, XO together, and then feed it to the algorithm and encrypt and produce the third block of ciphertext and so on. So that's how CBC modes or the cipher block chaining modes works. So in this mode, as you may understood, all ciphertexts interconnect each other. So, for example, when you consider this last block, so this last block depends on entire plain text. Why? This last block is a function of this input and this. This is a function of this and that. This is a function of this and this is a function of that and so on. That means last block here is a function of entire plain text. So you learn the name for that in the last lecture. So let's call it as message authentication code. As you may understood, if you apply the CB, uh, CBC mode, last block of the cipher text can be used as message authentication code. Why? If you use any data in the message and redo this operation, the last block will be different. That means this algorithm here will condense our input plain text into a fixed size code. So that is message authentication code. This is not a hash code, this is message authentication code. Why? We have a key input. Actually, these two considered as the key. We have a key input. So we have a message and we have a key input. So we create a fixed length of code, this last block. So that is a MAC, MAC message authentication code. So in the last week lecture, I introduced the way of checking the integrity. So that is hashing. And then we introduced message authentication codes. So, and we introduced HMAC, hash message authentication code. In the HMAC, what we do, we convert a hash algorithm into the MAC. But here, block cipher in the CBC mode is a pure MAC algorithm. That means we can use this directly to calculate message authentication code. In addition to that, actually we can use this for encryption as well as we can use these methods to calculate the message authentication code. So that means if you operate any block cipher in this cipher block chaining mode, that can be used as message authentication code plus encryption. That means we can use the same algorithm for check the integrity and confidentiality more. So because of that, so the, uh, the CBC mode is very popular. How do you going to share this uh, keys and these IVs with the senders and recipients? And then how do you uh, uh, do this decryption and things like that? I discuss, perhaps I will discuss those things uh, in the next lecture. So instead, now I would like to show some demo where we can encrypt and decrypt some data sets. So for that, I will use a popular open SSL package. So usually, actually, as I remember in my first course, which I delivered the cybersecurity course, if some of the students follow that, they are also demonstrated that. For the new students, purpose of new students, I will demonstrate that uh, how to use uh, open SSL, well-known cryptographic package in the world, uh, to do a simple encryption. So let me show this demo now. I will share my terminal. To do that. 
Maybe I'll share the desktop so that is it. Fine. So in this desktop, I will now uh, you can see my desktop here. I now close my slides. All right. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so I will go to some directory where we have some pictures and show you how do you encrypt these pictures. Okay, let's say I will bring some intermediate output created in my other lectures. Uh, let's see. I that we are going to crash. Nice. Right. Uh, so you see, I have a picture here. So some picture here. So what I now trying to do is encrypt this picture. So I will go to that directory. Right. So I go to this directory, which has this picture. Uh, so the picture is this egria.jk. Uh, that is the picture should be here. So this picture, right? I'm going to encrypt that. For that, I'm using the package called OpenSSL. In all all uh, Linux-based uh, machines, usually the OpenSSL by default installed. Otherwise, you can install using apt get install command. Uh, in OpenSSL can be installed on Linux versions as well. Uh, the website to get it uh, www.openssl.org. Uh, so that is the website. It has all the versions. You know, you know it's a very stable package uh, with recent releases as well. Uh, so you can use this, install it, and then you can use it for encrypting the data. Right. So how do you use it? You say OpenSSL ENC, and then you have to give your algorithm. The algorithm, let's say I want to use AES, and then you want to give the key size, let's say 256. Then you want to give the operational mode, let's say CBC, cipher blockchaining mode. After that, you need to give the input parameter, so your input parameter is this file, and then your output file. Output file, let's say, uh, new.jpg, right? When you run this command like that, it has a password. You can give a password, twice, then it creates the encrypted data. So you see, even though it called it as a new JPEG, so it is not a JPEG, JPG file, it's encrypted JPG file, no one can be able to open or the view it because it's encrypted properly. So this is the plain text file, we produce the encrypted file. So now how do you decrypt it? So we do the, uh, this command to decrypt, we say open SSL, ENC, minus D for decryption and then we give the we have to do the same algorithm name because A is and the same key size and same operational mode cipher block chaining mode and now our in now my input is my cipher text file that is new dot jpeg then my output is maybe the new plain text file. Let's say it uh, asun.jpg. When it runs like that, it has again a password. So you have to give the correct password. 
So when you give a correct password, it decrypted back. So let's see whether it get decrypted. So you see Kasum JP. So you see it's we got the image. So you you got the image back. Right? So that's a simple way of encrypting and decrypting a file without writing the program. So I will give you some examples of Java examples where you can write a pro program to do the same thing. 